Okay, it is five minutes to two, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Kenny, who I've been working with for the last couple of weeks. It's, um, it's, a, it's been great fun, hasn't it? Um, yeah. It's my great privilege to introduce our head of streaming, Kenny Gorman, who's going to tell you everything you need to know about Atlas Stream Processing. Can we give him a big round of applause, please? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, yeah, so my name is Kenny Gorman. Uh, hopefully you saw the keynote. We talked a little bit about stream processing there, showed a quick demo. Uh, this session, we're going to go into greater detail. We're going to dive deep. Come on in if you guys, just real quick, come on in if you're going to attend. Please come sit in front. It'll be easier to see. Awesome. OK, let's get started. So just quick agenda items. Uh, it, can everybody hear me OK? Can you hear me OK in the back? OK. So just some quick agenda items. We're going to talk about why we built Atlas Stream Processing. We're going to introduce some key concepts and key features that maybe you didn't see this morning. We're going to talk about how to manage and run a stream processing instance. And then I'm going to show you some more syntax around creating stream processors. And I think we're going to kind of skip through the high level stuff pretty quick. So here I covered a little bit of that in the keynote. And we're going to dive into the nitty gritty details. So how many people here are kind of interested in technical details and more? Who? Yeah, I kind of figured. OK, perfect. OK, so this is kind of high level stuff. So just kind of keep this in the back of your mind. We believe that streaming data is core to modern apps. Industries are building new applications that delight customers, that are more competitive in their marketplaces. Streaming data is a part of that at its core. Uh, we, be, but we believe that stream processing is a fundamental building block. You saw Sahir's slide this morning where we were one of those icons along those building blocks in that, in that diagram, if you remember. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how we're thinking about things. Things like fraud and risk detection. You saw me build a little, bit, little simple DDoS detection, detection mechanism. Things like IoT processing. That is a huge one. Uh, connected cars. We have a lot of transportation, cu transportation customers that are interested in using stream processing. And then things like hyper-personalization. So all these technologies are using streaming data at their core. Now, this is the thing that's kind of interesting. When you think back about MongoDB, we have all know documents. We all know what a document looks like. We're used to manipulating and working with it. We know what the underscore ID field means. We know how to index them, things like this. But at its very core, a document and an event in an event stream are very, very similar. So take a look here. We've got an ID on the left, a document in the database, and we've got a timestamp on the right. In one case, we've got a mutable data store, and on the other side, we have an immutable data stream. Otherwise, things look pretty much the same. But event data is complex and requires complex processing capabilities. So many times, I'll take a look at this data structure here. This is another one just kind of like the keynote here. You'll notice that the, these documents are different. And this may be an event stream. If your event processing system does not have the capability to handle this kind of data, meaning it has a fixed schema, you're going to have a tough time. You're either going to have to pre-process the data enforce some sort of rigid schema before you put the data into the system, it's typically fraught with peril. Now, it's possible, but what if you don't own the data generation, like in an IoT source? Maybe a sensor has got a firmware upgrade, and now it's sending different kinds of data through the, through the event bus. This is a problem. So MongoDB has two key things that work well in this scenario. Number one, the document model. It worked great for this. I just showed you that. And number two, the aggregation framework. So if you use the aggregation framework, who's used the aggregation framework? Let's just see a show of hands. Don't be shy. OK. I'll just call that like 40% of you. The aggregation framework is an easy way to work with document data. And it does things like allows you to match or detect where keys exist or not. It's basically a Turing complete DSL. It's great. So it works naturally in a stream processing paradigm because it's a pipeline operation. So it allows you to create stages, like I showed this morning, build a pipeline, and then process them from source to sync. 
So this is kind of what Sahir said this morning. I won't go into detail about it. Doc, thing to take away here, stream processing is built around the document model. It handles continuous processing of data. So let's just touch on that. In a regular database, we design a query. We run the query. It's interpreted. A plan is created. It might use an index to fulfill that query. It returns results to a cursor. We iterate over the cursor and get the data back to our application, roughly speaking, right? In stream processing, it's different. You're always running the query. It's continuously running, filtering, matching, projecting, whatever your statement says, from source to sync. So it's always running that pipeline. It's always emitting the data based on whatever that query is. So a little bit different processing paradigm. And we had to handle that in MongoDB in order to make that work. And lastly, it leverages Atlas. So as you'd expect, robust processing in the cloud, multiple data centers, ability to scale, things like that. So why is this good for you as a developer? Why is this different or interesting? A couple things. Number one, continuous query. We talked about that a second ago. I won't dive too deep into that. But the next one is really interesting. I want you to think about it. Um, continuous validation. So continu continuous validation allows you to write validation stages in your stream processor using the dollar validate keyword. And this allows you to take the data that doesn't match some pattern and put it into a dead letter queue. So let's say you had a sensor that required, um, or a processor that required some sensor to give an integer value. And if you don't get an integer, maybe it's a missing key, maybe it's a string, or maybe a complex nested document, you can handle that exception, move it to a dead letter queue, and either process it in some other way, or delete it, or learn from that event and upgrade your processor, whatever that might be. But the important takeaway there is, we didn't put your data on the floor, we did not process the data, and ultimately gave you control over that stream of data. So continuous validation is a big piece of stream processing in MongoDB. Uh, lastly, continuous merge. And I'm going I'm to show examples of all this stuff. Continuous merge is, again, I showed that this morning, but allows you to take a pipeline of data, process it, and continuously merge it into Atlas. So there's no batch jobs. There's no time cycles. There's no other infrastructure you need. You can simply say, as you get a stream of events, please merge it into the database. OK. This is a high-level architecture of how it looks. It's kind of a mental model for you to kind of think about things. So we've got on the left sources like Kafka and obviously MongoDB chain streams. So that makes sense, right? Use chain stream as would be a, a primitive that we'd use right out of the gate. It allows you to then aggregate, filter, route, and process that data in Atlas streams, and then ultimately write it to MongoDB via that continuous merge or back out to Kafka. So you can compose these processors by writing in from Kafka, processing them, writing them back out again, too. So if you need to create complex logic or complex chains, that's possible as well. And Kafka is just the first messaging paradigm that we're going to support. So down the line, we'll support other ones like Kinesis, uh, things like this, PubSub. Um, and there's a, there's a whole list of other uh, capabilities that we want to do in terms of streaming source. Now, I want to point out that that Kafka is not hosted on Atlas. That is somebody else's Kafka, whether it's self-managed on your side, in your organization, maybe it's Confluent Cloud, or one of the other cloud vendors. So that's connecting to where your data already is in Kafka, processing it, and then landing it in Mongo, or reading it from Mongo, processing it, and landing it out to those Kafka topics. All right, let's talk a little bit about how we start these things and run them and, and, and how they're organized on Atlas. So who's using Atlas today? Are we oriented around Atlas? Me? OK, lots. OK, got it. Perfect. So the highest level box here is the Atlas project. Inside that project, we have the connection registry. This is where you're going to keep all the credentials and connection, like named connections, for things like Kafka. So in the demo this morning, I just called it a name. And you might have said, like, where did he specify the connection credentials? Where did he specify 
the security paradigm? Where did he give the password or username or any of that information? Well, that's kept in the connection registry. So you define those sources there, then you use them by name in your stream processors. We also have a streaming instance. And a streaming instance is nothing more than a logical entity that allows you to hold multiple stream processors. So let's say you were trying to detect fraud. Maybe you had two or three different types of stream processors for detecting fraud. You might keep them in a streaming instance called fraud, something like that. Think of it as a folder structure for stream processors. And then lastly, we have our Atlas clusters. Now, it's here on the diagram separate because I want you to know that stream processing on Atlas is separate from your database. We still have database clusters, just like we always have. Stream processing is something different. So you can use a database and use it as you always have. You can also fire up instances and run stream processors. Here's just a quick screen grab of what it looks like in Atlas or will soon. Here's that connection registry I talked about. OK, so you can see there's a button for adding Kafka, giving a connection. In this case, if you're familiar with Kafka, you give something like the bootstrap servers. I think that's all I want to talk about there. OK, let's talk about creating stream processors and using them. OK, so this is the real, real basic scaffolding of a stream processor. If you want to write a stream processor on, on Atlas, this is basically how you do it in just a couple steps. So just to remember, a stream processor is a pipeline of stages. OK, so one or more pi stages constitutes a pipeline. So you'll see that first line there. I don't have a pointer, but just that first line there says, define a source from the connection registry. You'll see this just a variable that we assign to a, to a document. And that source, in this case, is empty. Then you create stages using the existing MongoDB aggregation language. So all that language that's out there today, all those operators are available to you. You can do math. You can do project. You can do set operations. You can iterate. Everything that's available, with a couple exceptions where it doesn't make sense, is available in stream processing. So if you've used the aggregation framework today, tomorrow you can use it to write stream processors. You'll immediately be productive. OK, um, you can mix, match, iterate, test. And then you test using dot process. So dot process is really important. I'm going to talk about it and show a little bit more about it in a second. But dot process is your ability to test a stream processor. So one of the things that we were really passionate about is making sure the developer was productive from day one. One of the things we hated was a really, really long test cycle. You want to maybe mutate some data in some way, and it takes you 20 minutes to see if it worked. That's just ridiculous. No one wants to do that. Using dot process, you can build that pipeline, that stream processor, and in just a few seconds, test it like I did on screen before, see the output, decide if that's what you want, continue building more stages iteratively, interactively, and build your stream processor that way. This paradigm is what MongoDB aggregation framework users have been doing for years. So we know it's a tried and true paradigm. You start off simple. You build a little bit more complexity. You build more. You build more. And finally, you say, OK, cool. I got what I wanted. That's my processor. Process is your friend for that. All right, so let's create one. Let's, let's show you some real values. Let's kind of just create a fictitious one here. So, in this case, we've got sensor data being produced to Kafka. Uh, the data is complex. So what I mean by that is you'll see we have a timestamp, which all messages do. I'll talk about that in a second. We have a simple station ID. That's a string. And then we have measurements, and that's an array. So that's a complex document. Should look familiar. This is like kind of a, kind of a typical thing. And let's say we need to validate and aggregate this data. And then we need to continue, create a continuously maintained view of, of that on Atlas. Okay, So that's kind of our use case. So this is the entire stream processor. This isn't just like pseudocode. That's the entire stream processor. The thing I want to point out here is it doesn't take pages and pages of code. It doesn't take scaffolding and, and you know, including other libraries. And it's, it's not messy. It's just the aggregation framework. It is simple. 
So let's go line by line here, and I'll kind of call this out to you. The first line says var source and gives a Kafka source. You'll see it uses that name I talked about, and then it gives a topic. Then we do validate. OK, and validate is what I talked about before, the ability to validate that data and do something with it if it doesn't match that pattern. So in this case, it's looking to see if that measurement subdoc, this one right there, see measurements, is an array. Here, we're making sure it is array. OK? So that means it's validated. That way, if we want to iterate over the array in subsequent stages, we know it's going to work. If it isn't an array, it's going to go to the dead letter queue, and we can either process it later or write some other conditional logic around it. But at least we don't have a broken stream processor. Next, we're going to create a window. In this case, a tumbling window every 60 seconds. And then we're going to specify a sub pipeline. Now, the sub pipeline is just the way that the, that the window tumbles and how we group it. So we're going to unwind that array. Then we're going to group by sensor ID and then average the temperature. Right, so relatively simple. Um, uh, but the thing I want to point out is if we were to try and unwind that array and it wasn't an array, it wouldn't work. It'd crash. And in a streaming system, if one in one million messages isn't an array, you have a really unreliable stream processor. This gives you that reliability and control that you need for processing streaming data. And then lastly, we create a stage where we merge it into an Atlas cluster. This is just like, frankly, just like the merge we've always done. The only difference is it's continuously happening. So for every input event, we're going to write an output into the Atlas cluster. And lastly, and I can't see that at the end because there's a thing on the monitor, we're going to, oh, assemble the pipeline. So it's just an array of stages. And then we're going to call create stream processor, give it a name, and pass the pipeline. OK? That's an entire stream processor in Atlas Stream Processing. All right, so let's dive in the next level. Let's get a little bit more detailed about the capabilities. You're probably wondering, what can I build with this stuff? So um, the operators that exist for the aggregation framework all exist in stream processing. Like I said, a couple exceptions where they don't make sense. But think about this, last, last end, first, or maybe conditional logic like uh, let, or accumulators like top. These are natural paradigms for stream processing. These are things that already exist day one. We didn't have to go write new code. They're not buggy. This is stuff that's been working for years and works naturally and magically, frankly, in stream processing. Uh, and then at the bottom, we've got a couple new ones I want you to take a look at. Tumbling window, hopping window, and then source. Kafka, in this case, and emit. Emit can also be back to Kafka. OK. Let's talk about the development life cycle. Let's talk a little bit about how we create these things and we know what we're building is going to be what we want. So I talked before about how to start a stream processor, but we didn't talk about sample. And what sample is, is when you're in the shell, Sample gives you the ability to see that data coming back into the shell so that you can make decisions on it. So what it's going to do is it's going to bring the data back from Kafka, right, right through Kafka, the native Kafka driver, back into Atlas, into the shell, and you're going to be able to like, see that data coming back and then control C that when you've seen enough. So it's going to spool it as long as the data is there. So in most Kafka systems, that might be a lot. Uh, but you control C it when you've seen enough sampling then you can make decisions about how to mutate or change that data in your processor. Um, and you can run it in a couple different ways. You can call sample, and it'll do that. Or you can call get processor, give it the name of the processor, and call sample. OK. So I talked about process before. Process has implicit sampling. So whenever I run process, it's also going to sample the data back to me. So I'm going to get that feedback and be able to make make decisions on it. All right. And then it told, by the way, at the end, like you see all this data coming back, you control C, it returns control back to you. That's an important point. So here's how it kind of looks developing with process. Maybe I develop a pipeline. I say pipeline equals x, y. Then I say process that pipeline. I pass it to it. It's going to evaluate it, execute it, bring back that data, 
give me control of the user, and I can run it again and again and again. All right, you're probably wondering about how we connect to Kafka. Like, how does it work with consumer groups, and how does it work with topics? How do we configure all that stuff? Uh, let's just kind of dive into it here. So, in the case of Kafka, now this is different for every source, but this is a Kafka source. We expected this to be the most popular one. Obviously, Kafka is pervasive and very popular, so that's why we developed Kafka first. But we really wanted to have a first class client, like a first class experience. So, we use LibRD Kafka, if you're familiar, it's a C client for Kafka under the covers. Um, and here's how you kind of control it you specify the source. You have the ability to give a connection name from the connection registry I talked about before. You can specify a topic, Kafka topic. You can pass a configuration to Kafka. So whatever Kafka configuration is supported, you can pass those values. That's important. And then you can give a timestamp override. So I talked a little bit about timestamps. I'm going to dive in a little bit more about how these differ in, in a streaming system. But you can give it an override in, in case you need to. Um, what that means is if the source event in Kafka has an underscore TS uh, field, then you're going to want to override it because we're going to need underscore TS, a reserve word. And then you can specify the time field, and you can give a, a function for how to process that time field. So this is really important. If you're getting events coming in from Kafka and they have dates on a field, like maybe it's an IoT sensor, and that IoT sensor has a field that has the date that it was sampled. That may come in as a string, or maybe it's epoch. It could be lots of different dates. Or, or that string could have different formats. So how do I process that into a canonical timestamp in the streaming system? Well, we give you the ability to put an expression there. So you could do two date. You can parse the string back to epoch. And that data type is always going to be the MongoDB BSON date data type. OK? Lastly, allowed lateness. So late arriving data is a fact of life in streaming systems. Uh, sometimes an IoT sensor may be offline, and then it comes online and gives you data. Or maybe everybody's idea of what time is is a little bit off, like wall clock time. So maybe the stream is actually out of order slightly. That's fine in streaming systems. That's a normal part of streaming data. It's not a normal part of databases. In fact, it creates a mess. So how do we handle that? You saw me earlier create those processing windows. Those windows will adhere to allowed lateness. All that means is the window won't close until that allowed lateness is, is adhered to. So if your data sometimes is an hour late, you might set this a little bit bigger to accommodate that late arriving data. If not, you know, maybe you don't have a problem with it. But this is like a really core primitive for stream processing systems. And we picked a default of three seconds. Why? This seems about right normally, something around this time. All right. Um, so now look at this example document at the bottom. Kind of look at the keys, right? So we have the time stamp, which is now a BSON date type, underscore TS. So that's your primary key, essentially, for an event. Then we have underscore stream meta. So what we do in this case is we pull in all the header information from Kafka. Again, we're trying to be a first class Kafka client. So we take the Kafka header information, uh, the key that was used, um, the timestamp that Kafka ingested it, uh, the partition count offset, and any other header information. And that is now available in your document for processing as well. Maybe your routing data conditionally based on this. Uh, maybe you want to know what topic it was in in order to process it in some different way conditionally. So additional metadata that coming in from Kafka, first class Kafka client. All right, <clears throat> we talked about validation. Validation, if you, if you walk away with nothing else from this talk, remember validation. Remember, we're taking Kafka data, continuously processing it, and you can validate it. It's a very, very important point. And I think you'll find it super useful. So again, validate us with the dollar validate operator. In this case, we're actually specifying not only an expression like not equal, uh, the racer name is not equal to, to pace car, but we're also specifying a JSON schema. So this is how you can enforce schemas and Atlas stream processing. 
you can pass it a JSON schema, and if it doesn't pass the, the validation, where does it go? It goes to the dead letter queue, just like everything else. So we don't block it, we don't crash, we don't stop our stream processor, we keep moving, validating, and moving any data that doesn't pass that to the dead letter queue. You're starting to see a pattern here, hopefully. All right. Uh, a couple things to point out in here, just take a peek. You might also notice that we're validating um, required fields here, like the name of the fields, and also its properties. So this is interesting, too. Not only are we saying that the, the schema must exist with these fields, but we're also saying the string must have this pattern match for a date. So it gives you very, very fine-grained control over that input stream of data. All right, so I keep saying dead letter Q, dead letter Q, what is it? How does it work? So if we have a validation and we've set it up and configured it, we'll have a connection name that we're passing the data to. In this case, the database is called test pipeline and a collection name DLQ data. And whenever we fail that validation, it's going to write that out to Mongo. So I showed that in the, thing, in, the, in the demo this morning. The very last line was we looked in the dead letter queue and we saw data in there. And it's going to tell us why it didn't pass the validation field. It's going to give us information about what that input event was and allows us, again, to make a decision about it. Do we need to reprocess it? If we need to, that's easy. We'll just create another processor to do it. But maybe we got our processing logic wrong and we want to make a new version of our processor. Gives you fine-grained control over that. Then when you start it, you're going to give it a name, you're going to give it that processing pipeline, and then you'll just specify the validate location. So just to kind of tie it together, at the top here you see us define an object, a document that says validate loc, we give some details, then we define a pipeline, we give it a validator. If it fails a validator, it's going to go into the validate location, we start the stream pro or we define the stream processor, and we give the validation. OK, a couple more of these, and then we'll, we'll take some questions. I've just got, I think, three more of these. Let's talk about Windows. Windows are a new uh, stage, a new operator in, in uh, Atlas Stream Processing. Uh, this is something we had to add for streaming specifically. It didn't exist before. Uh, there's the notion of Windows in, uh, in the aggregation framework. But there's not the notion of these kind of continuous tumbling windows or hopping windows or essentially streaming windows. So let's just talk real quickly about how it works. You define a window. You give it an interval. In this case, it's 60 seconds. And again, an inner pipeline. I showed this on a slide a few slides ago. Um, and, the, and this inner pipeline is nothing more than another aggregation. So if you know the aggregation framework, you know how to build these. Uh, one last thing is, just like we have these implicit projections for Kafka underscore meta, we have the same thing here. In stream meta, we're going to give you the source type, Kafka, and we're also going to give you the window uh, boundaries, the start and the end. Now, this is really important. This allows you to then do something like, maybe you're passing this to a graphing system. And if you're passing this to a graphing system, you're going to, know when, you're going to need to know when the, the date timestamp was for the you know, the period that this was emitted. So this gives you that handy date time. You don't have to do any more projections. Automatically, the Windows boundaries are passed through to the outputting document. OK, we talked about continuously merging collections. I'm not going to go too super deep in this. It's just like what it sounds like. Continuously merging into Atlas, you pick a connection, any Atlas DB that's in MongoDB Atlas. Um, you give it a name. Give it a database, give it a collection, and we'll continuously write the data there. Uh, it writes the data on either all the events that are passing through, or if you're running a window, it's going to do it on the window boundaries. So like if the window is tumbling every 60 seconds and you're watching the database, you're going to see new data every 60 seconds. Like that. Make sense? OK. Just point out one more thing. Um, in merge, you can do upsert or insert, and we support both of those as well. So very popular pattern in a stream processor 
is to upsert a collection with the very latest data. Maybe it's these sensor readings that we're taking. We want to have a materialized view. We always want to have the, the latest and greatest sensor um, you know, values. Maybe we're using top n or last, like I mentioned before. Um, and then maybe we're using upsert and merge. So we keep kind of a billboard of all those sensors and their latest values. Very popular use case. And that's just a regular collection. So I can create indexes on it. I can replicate it. I can do whatever I want with it. So just note that once we've written it from Atlas Stream Processors to the database, it's just like any other data. There's no, nothing special there. OK. So now just a couple of you know, command and control uh, options. You can start and stop a processor like you would imagine. You can start them with a degree of parallelism that's greater than 1. Okay? You can call stats on them and get stats about how much data it's processed or whether it's up or down. You can drop them. You can list them. And then you can list all those connections. So pretty full-featured capability of understanding and navigating how many processors do I have, what is their pipeline, how are they running, that kind of thing. OK. So I was approached in the, in the hall multiple times with a lot of questions. Um, we have some of the engineers here who wrote this. Can you raise your hands? They're over here. Um, feel free to grab me or them if you have questions. They're not normally here all the time. So if you have, if you want, if you have a question that's engineering related, you want to know how this works, grab them, pester them. They're a great resource that they're here um, and use them. Otherwise, I'm happy to answer a few more questions. We have about 12 minutes. If you have any questions, just stick up your hand, and I'll bring over a microphone. Guys. You're the first person I saw. So I have a question uh, related to the validation part. So for doing the validation, is it, uh, I mean, I can hear. it be done only on the attribute? Can't. You can't hear? I can't hear. Sorry, it's really noisy up there. That's OK. So the question is related to the validation. So for doing the validation, uh, can it be done only on the attributes of the current message? Or you can maybe do it based on some external, let's say, service or a collection also. For an example, I have a product. This is the price. I want to check that this price of this product should be in this range. So can I get the range from a different endpoint or a collection or something like that? OK, there's a lot of questions in there. Excellent question. So I'll just summarize the question. It says, can you validate on something that's external to the document that's being passed through? Um, the quick answer is, not yet. Uh, so common use case, so I can see why you're asking. Um, ultimately, we're going to support dollar lookup. You just heard them announce that dollar lookup has got a lot faster, so we're excited about that. Uh, we plan to use that uh, in this, this private preview right now, so at the moment it's not there, but it will be by GA. It's the most common requested thing. It's funny you say that. Uh, in, to be able to do lookup not only for enriching, but also for validation. So that's a great question. Um, I'll, I'll, but I'll say one more thing there, and that is, in the pipeline, validate isn't a singleton. It can be anywhere or multiple times in that pipeline. So you can move it to different places to use it where you need it. So I know that's not pulling in an external source, but if your document has additional granularity or additional detail, resolution of keys or something in a previous stage, you can move it up and use those too. So like a lot of different capabilities kind of built in there. That's a great question. Did I answer it OK? OK. OK. Next question. OK. Um, with the parallelism, if you've got a window, how many are they all emitting? Uh, and then you have to do something with those? Or? Okay, so you had to answer, ask the hardest question. Thank you. Uh, so let me just. So the question is, if you have multiple, if you have more than degree of parallelism equal to one, if it's larger than that, greater than that, how do you manage how windows work? Because are they all emitting at random times, or what do you get on the opposite side? Is that your basically your question? Okay, so. That is one of the harder parts of stream processing. Frameworks like Flink have done a very, very good job of handling that. Um, as we support, so just to kind of back up, 
our thesis here was we didn't want to build a toy. We didn't want to build something that was kind of a half step. We were very serious about stream processing. So we started building in checkpointing. And so every one of those windows has a, every message has a watermark in the stream. So we're actually managing watermarks. We're actually checkpointing uh, when we start the window and throughout the window. So we'll actually be able to recover state for those windows and actually be able to share state. So that shared state is what's going to allow those windows to emit in unison. Does that make sense? So not right now. It's private preview. If you want to try the private preview and as we release those functions, um, test it for us and tell us if it works the way you want, that would be great. But yes, that is ultimately our plan. We know that that kind of primitive scaling state is both hard but important. So that's a, that's a key value of ours. Good, great question. Before I hand the microphone to one of these gentlemen at the back, um, can I draw your attention to this barcode that we have up on the screen at the moment? We would love it if you would scan that barcode and give us some feedback on how this session went. Uh, it allows us to, um, to improve the, the sessions that we run at future conferences. Um, so we really appreciate that. So I'm going to run to the back now and hand this. Um, hi. So in like traditional kind of Kafka stream processing, you're going to consume, like do some processing, and then commit your offset back to Kafka so that in like any kind of recovery scenario, you're going to be able to resume from where you left off. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that mechanism in Mongo stream processing? Yeah, great question. So um, uh, the way it works in Atlas stream processing is uh, we do keep track of offsets both on our own and then pushing them back into Kafka. So now you might say, like, why do you, do, why do you keep track of them on your own? Well, we're not only going to support Kafka. And so we need to have some sort of internal capability to checkpoint and watermark so that we know what authoritative time is. We know how to write a checkpoint and recover to that point, And then we know how to tell Kafka to get to that same point. So it is complicated. It's, it's a lot of work. Um, but that's the design that we have right now. And it does two things. One is it allows you to track with consumer groups coming from Kafka. So if you were to look at Kafka, your consumer groups would be correct. And number two is it allows us to have a journal, just like we do with the database. Like Obviously, we're pretty good at doing that part of it, right? journaling changes. We have a similar engine built into stream processing that does that as well. Did I answer your question? Yeah, good, good question. Have we got any questions over this side? Because I feel like I've been, I'm going to come bring this to you. Uh, great session. Uh, I had a couple of questions for you. Uh, do you support like chain stream as a source? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the way chain streams works is chain streams can be both a source and a sync, and you can use chain stream to Kafka, Kafka to chain stream. Okay. So you can do mix and match however you want. Chain streams are interesting because uh, they work a little bit different than Kafka. Uh, there's a resume token. The data payload's a little different. Um, and what's interesting there, I think, is as a source, so if you've got data changing in Mongo, insert, update, delete, that data is mutating, it's making a chain stream, you're going to get that event coming through the chain stream. Um, processing that chain stream, like if you're familiar, there's something called full document. It's a nested document that shows the whole payload. Being able to process that into a clean image of what that change is, if you're like just moving it down to a dashboard or saving it in another database, that works excellent. So you can actually mutate it on the wire using the aggregation framework, change it, project it to however you want it, and then save it somewhere else with merge. That works great. Yeah, great. It's a big use case. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good question. And, and, and one other thing, like, uh, how long the window size can be? Uh, there is a max on the window size. Do you guys remember what it is? Days? Weeks? Well, I can't remember. There's, there, is a, there is a max on the window size. I don't think we can remember what it is. It's big. Uh, I, don't, I don't think you could do a year like that, like something in that range. Most use cases are you know, seconds, minutes, hours kind of thing. And frankly, the most common use case is to build processors for all those at once. So you might have a minute view, hour view, day view, and you're just you know, pulling that fire hose of data out of Kafka, summarizing for each one, and, and kind of and doing it that way. I don't remember what the max is, but we can get back to you on it. OK. So uh, one, one last question. Like in terms of like a long running, like I assume this is a part of the pipeline, like the streaming pipeline will be part of a long running process in whatever like language we choose. So uh, like how we build observability into it? Yeah. Yeah. So 
The question is, you know, we talked about this as a long-running processor. It's running continuous. So it makes sense that you would need a better level of observability than normal, or at least a good level of observability. So the answer is, this is high on our priority list. Uh, I showed you a couple of graphs within Atlas on what it looks like to, to watch the, the, uh, the bytes in, bytes out, and, and you know, those kind of things. Um, you can run stats and see it. But ultimately, we'll be integrating everywhere Atlas is integrated. So if it's a data dog situation, we'll be doing that as well. So our goal at, at, from the product perspective is that when you use Atlas database and you use stream processing, that those APIs all work very, very similarly. So logging, exporting your logs, graphs, charts, you know, hooks into like Datadog and things like that. Those should all work. Those, yep. Uh, hi. It was mentioned earlier that dedicated nodes are coming for search. Are there dedicated nodes for stream processing? Eric, are there dedicated nodes for stream processing? Yes. <laughs> he says yes. Cool. Uh, so it'll be Kubernetes. It's a Kubernetes backend, dedicated nodes. Yeah. Okay. Good question. I think we're going to make this the last question. A question. So, what is the resilience mechanism? Like, can you run can you run them in parallel? And what is the delivery semantics? Is it at least once, exactly once? Ah. Or, uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry, I got a little feedback here. Okay. So, the, I didn't hear all those questions, but I heard the one about what is your consistency guarantees? Yeah. Uh, at least once, right now. Okay. So we're starting with at least once. We know we got to get there exactly once. We like I said. We want to be a first-class Kafka client. We're going to get to that point. Private preview right now, it's at least once. And you had one more question about scaling, I think. Uh, OK, got it. So is it multi-region? Is it multi-AZ? And do we have failover? The short answer is we do not have failover right now between multi-AZ and multi-region. So you would simply have the stream processor defined in multiple areas, and you would need to command and control, like with the CLI, start and stop them as needed. But they would adhere to the consumer group ID and pick up where they left off, use that checkpointing, that kind of thing. Does that make sense? OK, I think we're going to end the session there. So can we have a massive round of applause for Kenny Gorman here? Thanks very much, Kenny.